we see that every day new drugs are synthesized and published. The quantity of new papers published on new drugs is enormous, but only a few of them come to the market. Could you please explain why is it so? Yes. <laughs> I'm honest, I'm not a specialist of this part of the, of the drug design, drug synthesis process. But what I can, I can tell is that uh, uh, the drug which finally reaches the market is the result of uh, a strict evaluation of all parameters, in which most probably the synthetic part is the less critical. Once you get a drug, ideally you would be able to, to use it for, clini for clinical purposes. So where the space between, uh, uh, where the space becomes uh, really narrow is just at the level of the clinical trials. Furnishing to uh, biochemists and pharmacologists a final compound can take, uh, um, can take most probably a reasonable amount of time. But at the end, you, are, you can be almost sure that this drug, this molecule, will be handled by the pharmacologist and the medicinal chemist. What is afterwards problematic is making this drug suitable, not only for in vitro tests, but mainly for in vivo studies. And in all of this, and then, of course, on, uh, cl on um, clinical trials on, uh, on animals and at the very end on humans. And of course, each of these steps is uh, extremely risky. That really, I would say, I, um, it depends also on, 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 uh, on, um, on, on which is the challenging which is the challenge you are facing, but uh, the, the, the risk of failure in each of these steps is extremely high. So uh, from all the potential compounds which can be active in silico, for example, when a, a synthetic um, um, a medicinal chemist designed for the first time a compound, to the compound which finally is marked, I think there are a really high, high risk of unsuccess, which finally made uh, uh, made extremely challenging and difficult the whole drug design process. Speaking about organic chemistry, in 1972, Woodward and Ashen Moser completed a famous synthesis of vitamin B12. It's a really huge, complicated molecule. That's why the synthesis was performed in more than 100 steps. And this synthesis at that time proved that we can synthesize virtually anything. That was 50 years ago, but organic chemistry still exists now and there are a lot of scientists working in it. Which problems do we tackle nowadays? What inspires organic chemists to develop new methods, even though we can use the old ones and synthesize anything we want? Well, I think uh, the classical canonical chemists is an important um, source of inspiration for chemists. Because it uh, provides the operator the fundamental logics underpinning each synthetic concept. What is uh, really nowadays inspiring chemists is like pushing and triggering the development of new chemistry is, uh, if I can say, uh, approaching the problems, which, for example, at uh, a basic undergraduate course of organic chemists are considered prohibitive. Just today, for example, this morning, before coming to the interview, I had a lecture, organic chemistry one dealing with the, the reactivity of alkanes. And alkanes are uh, considered usually the most inert uh, elements, the most inert uh, uh, class of, uh, of compounds in organic synthesis. But nowadays, realizing 
modular and uh, processor operation on alkanes, most probably with just some uh, simple modification, really uh, became a, a hot topic in synthesis. But uh, mm, I, I would say that this is not most probably the most related part to the drug design, to what organic chemistry can do for drug design. For sure, uh, where we experienced massive, massive contributions of, of the highest interest for medicinal, for the drug design is in fluorination chemistry. Uh, almost everyone knows that uh, fluorine can uh, properly tune and modulate critical physical chemical properties of organic arrays. And uh, introducing uh, in a precise and uh, expeditious way fluorine into an organic skeleton can really improve the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic behavior of the com of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, of these molecules. And in this context, in the last I would say 15, 20 years, the introduction of fluorine into molecule in my opinion, became the most attractive part of organic synthesis for drug design, for the drug design process. We uh, did um, contributions in the area. And for example, uh, among the degree of fluorination to be imparted into a molecule, significant challenges are observed when you are dealing with the monofluoromethyl groups. And in a few years ago, we reported an extremely simple procedure based on a solid rational already acquired since decades, but never applied to fluorination chemistry. And in just one synthetic operation, we could, uh, uh, we could, uh, uh, we could deliver this uh, fluoromethyl group into a plethora of organic, uh, organic uh, liquids. So I would say that, uh, uh, in definitive, uh, fluorination chemistry is one of the part of uh, uh, medicinal chemistry much more connected to uh, pure organic synthesis because of the proven use of uh, fluorine modulating properties of molecules. Speaking further about the different methodologies used in organic synthesis, there are probably two quite, I would say, mysterious ones. The first one is photochemistry, and the second one is enzymatic uh, synthesis. Could you please explain if these two methods are applicable to drug synthesis? Yes, for sure. Uh, what is important is, uh, in both aspects, mainly in the photochemical approach, is understanding that the theoretical background behind it was, uh, was known. What nowadays, uh, chemists do when uh, attempting to apply this strategy is finding the optimal conditions for generating the radicals, which ultimately are the reactive species involved in photochemical processes. And of course, it is uh, a convenient, uh, extremely convenient and cost-effective way because uh, of mainly when uh, we are considering uh, uh, solar light for, uh, for making this, um, these operations. And uh, uh, again, it has been applied to forge new carbon-carbon bonds, not always uh, resulting from uh, old, uh, from um, relatively conceptually old approaches. But what I would say is that uh, nowadays is a routinely included and applied in the synthesis of uh, in the synthesis of important. Uh, uh, chemical agents with perspective to pharmaceutical application. And the other one is enzymatic. Uh, enzymes are uh, constitutively present in all the human beings, in all the animal beings, in all vegetables and, uh, and fungi. And uh, uh, this chemistry was developed, I would say, around the 80s when the careful extraction of enzymes or, or wall cells were considered afterwards 
as a normal reagents for organic synthesis. One of the most brilliant aspects, for example, is the chemoselective reduction or the stereoselective, sorry, reduction of ketones to chiral alcohols. The most intriguing aspect of this transformation is that taking an enzyme or a war cell means considering it as a stereoselective imparting reagent. Everyone knows, uh, for example, reducing a ketone, a prochiral ketone with the sodium borohydride does not bring any stereochemical information to the final compound. But using, for example, uh, alcohol de de hydrogenase with known stereochemical background, with, no, uh, with, the, with the known stereochemical uh, significance could really help in preparing in uh, up to 99.1, uh, dot, dot nine, uh, zero dot one, uh, and antioselectivity ratios on the final compound. So I, I think that uh, uh, nowadays enzymatic processes are often considered mainly for uh, the important application in the chiral synthesis. And the, most of the compounds nowadays are prepared with this uh, logics because it's uh, an extremely basic logic. So, and, and an important aspect is at this level. Uh, the organic chemist for controlling the success of processes with enzymes may be benefited may benefit from uh, some knowledge in related disciplines like uh, uh, microbiology. Because you have never to, you, you should never forget that the compound you are considering a chemical agent is a protein, is a biochemical entity. And a pure organic chemist, in my opinion, may have a, May, may have some difficulties in the correct handling of this, uh, of this, uh, of this material. So uh, looking at the interconnected field of uh, biochemistry, microbiology, can even improve your success in this kind of transformations. About the career path uh, that drug synthetic chemists can choose. Traditionally, when you finish your master's as a drug synthesis specialist, you can either go to industry or stay in academia. But are there any other areas where, where you can apply your knowledge? And if not, what's, what's the main difference between academic research and industrial research? Well, uh, if you are interested in doing the research, you have two main uh, uh, two main uh, environments. One is the academic, one is the, uh, the pharma industry, the, the company-based uh, the company -based research. Honestly, I wouldn't say too much research outside these two fundamental blocks. For sure, you could consider to apply for a job to institutions doing some uh, research, like, uh, for example, the European Medicinal Agency, uh, some uh, national equivalent, but they are much dealing with uh, application, applicative research, much more than pure research. This is because of the uh, of the um, of the logics motivating their existence, and also the finality of the of the of the knowledge they want uh, they want spread. So, if you want to do research, you have just two options. What is the difference between, uh, or otherwise, in in uh, for sure in contexts where uh, it exists. You could also consider research institutes like uh, national research institutes, which are very similar, but not equal to academia. Because the academia has an important aspect, which is the teaching. You cannot be an academic without doing teaching. And for example, in, in countries 
where the habilitation system still exists, for example, German speaking countries, I did my habilitation in Vienna. I had to prove my skills, not only in research, but also in didactic, in teaching. And so there are countries where the, the didactic, the teaching activity is almost compressed and you can dedicate yourself to research, which I would say would make like a kind of uh, university, uh, teaching free university with, the, with some differences. But uh, in general, the progress of academic research is just producing and including into the panorama new scientific background, new knowledge. The university really looks at introducing concepts before applications. At the company level, I think this equilibrium is reached. It is important to introduce new concepts from experience, but you are really focused on the final true applications of your research products. In chemistry, in, uh, at, uh, doing chemistry at academia means also a lot of freedom. I can investigate whatever physical or chemical event can be of my interest. Research at uh, institutions like uh, companies means have a strong focus on the final objective of my research, which at a given percentage can also encompass having some free research. But uh, this is for sure the not most important part of your research. Vice versa, in chemistry, I do many, uh, I, I, I explain this many times to my students. We have uh, uh, projects which uh, for any reason are too, too, challenge, too, too, too challenging. They are extremely difficult and so people would benefit from having like a kind of side project also for motivating. This is good because uh, in this way you could uh, 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 the, you could uh, motivate yourself and say to your family, to your girlfriend, to your boyfriend that the failure problem is not your person because anyway he's able to do other kind of things. But means that we always, even at academia, for uh, much that we are uh, uh, like um, free in selecting our research topics have to have at least a strong and basic aspect and basic research team, which for sure is not the same at, uh, in, uh, in, in company where you have to consider this topic also in premise as an application. And would you say that a PhD is highly recommended to receive a position in industry or is an internship at a company quite sufficient for a person to stay and grow further? Well, um, I think um, already in life, having a PhD helps. Uh, it depends also because when you enter in a, in a company, of course, you have not an high level responsib responsibility position. But if you really consider yourself talented enough to go up on the ranks of the uh, research organization of the industry, uh, having a PhD makes uh, highly qualified for uh, securing the objective. Also because uh, um, Having a PhD somehow would also facilitate the contact with academia. There are a good uh, connection between academia and industry. And for sure, being a PhD, being in process of a PhD would, uh, in my opinion, assist you in establishing contacts with academia. Because 
you would uh, intimately be considered by an academic as, okay, this is my peer. Even if I'm professor, and of course you cannot be professor because there is a kind of uh, diversification, this helps a lot. And uh, depending on uh, the personal motivation, if you really look at uh, becoming an important, uh, uh, an important member of the research academia in industry, a PhD would really benefit. Lastly, I know some colleague who was uh, at industry with a PhD, and then he or she considered to come again to academia because of, for personal reasons, for research reasons, and for sure having a PhD is uh, the conditio sine qua non for making this journey. So you can be extremely successful in academia, but then for any, uh, any legitimate reason, you will say, okay, I starting from now, I see myself much more, uh, uh, much more uh, involved in academia. And of course, having the PhD is the basics for accomplishing this job. So I would definitely recommend it. Then if you, for a personal reason, whatever you want, um, there would be no interest in developing uh, a, an extremely high level career because everyone is uh, more than uh, free to, to, to select in this, in this sense. Uh, having a PhD uh, is not, uh, is not mandatory. So I think, that, but in general, having the PhD makes thing makes easier the the securing of uh, an high responsibility level. Yeah, I think a well-known person who who's done this transition from. Uh, industry to academia was Ben Feringa, the Nobel laureate of uh, 2017. <laughs> Feringa is Feringa. Which hard and soft skills are crucial for drug synthetic chemists? Among the conditio sine qua non, I would say an extremely high motivation. Because doing the research is, is nice, is fascinating but it's extremely hard, it's competitive. You have to consider that failure can happen. And so you have to be robust enough to, to, be, to be independent, to consider that if a project is not working, is because of some known or unknown reason. If a project is not working, can be because of your limited experience on that topic or because the topic inherently is extremely difficult. So you have to consider and you have to make a really critical analysis on yourself, both as a person, so even considering a psychological point of view, but also as a scientist, can I do, can I approach this uh, highly challenging topic with a knowledge which I do not possess on this subject? And so it becomes essential to make a critical analysis in yourself, in my opinion. Um, then I would say that the other aspect is um, considering things not too personally. You need also to have a good mentor. A good mentor is someone who could help you in selecting a strategy, which can be like a job strategy or scientific strategy. The mentor is an important person in the career of anyone because with her or his experience, he or she can provide you important skills 
important uh, uh, highlighting you critical steps of your career and also encouraging you because people doing science need to be encouraged. It's quite uh, rare that as soon as you go, as soon as you enter in the lab, a challenge object, a challenging objective is realized. So you need to understand what are the intrinsic conceptual limits of the operation are doing, but also to be extremely confident on yourself. And on all these aspects, a good mentor is an added value. I would like to ask you a rather personal question. What's your main source of motivation to wake up in the morning and go to the lab? And I'm uh, uh, much more driven by curiosity. Um, and I always try to combine curiosity with uh, challenging reactions and uh, uh, simple solutions. I always say that uh, um, my, uh, I always find extremely, uh, I always try extremely important to look at the perspective of chemistry, um, which can be solved with the simple tools in chemistry. For example, one of the reactions I most do are just uh, nucleophilic additions, nucleophilic substitution addition, and so on. And so I think that uh, uh, imparting a highly a high molecular complexity with very simple reagents many times helps in uh, many times helps in uh, solving long-standing issues. For example, the way I mentioned before, we prepared uh, fluoro compounds is based on something known since decades, but no one did it before. So many times is also, this is an important part of my day, updating and reading a lot of papers. Important, not only recently published papers, but also the old literature which many times can be a dramatic source of inspiration for challenging because there exist errors in, uh, in, uh, in citations, in citing papers published maybe uh, 30 years ago, which then were uh, for, for some reason neglected by the community. So also looking inspiration in the old literature uh, makes uh, um, makes my, my days uh, quite busy because it's not easy to, to find them. But many times it's uh, resulted for a challenging uh, uh, important aspect. So in general, is uh, my personal motivation in contributing to the scientific knowledge, to introducing new concepts, but also it's important to find something like a basic backbone, a basic skeleton of your research. I, I think the community, the scientific community, doesn't like scientists, also very successful, which uh, are uh, with uh, moderate sources, considering uh, like uh, uh, 30 different research fields. You have always to be focused on one main research field and then considering the I, the, the others as, um, as, um, uh, as collateral. But you need, it's quite important to have a basic backbone of uh, uh, knowledge to which you are uh, always taking inspiration and of course furnishing contributions in terms of publication papers. I think it's time to ask you the last question for today. If you had a chance to give one piece of advice to yourself back in the days when you just began your studies, what would it be? I think uh, the motivation, the curiosity are more uh, personal aspects. But uh, what I would say extremely important is considering 
three basic areas of knowledge. One is the organic chemistry, also with vistas to the most recent developments in the area. So having a clear focus of which are the topics, the hot topics on a given moment. The other one is considering always the bridging between organic chemistry and pharmaceutical chemistry. Do not see organic chemistry fully disconnected by pharmaceutical chemistry and do not see pharmaceutical chemistry fully disconnected by organic chemistry. You should see like uh, as um, the two pillars of a bridge. And third, for being successful in chemistry, at least in synthetic chemistry, you have to rely on good skills in structural elucidation. This is extremely important, mainly if uh, the main part of your job will be focused on synthesis. Why is it important? Because you have to assign structures, but also because uh, understanding a reaction mechanism with the aid of uh, the structural elucidation can bring to flourishing new projects. If I modulate this uh, aspect of my transformation, I can boost, I can force the formation of a potential secondary compound in my first three target synthesis. And so you can even uh, ramify again the, uh, the possible uh, source for success. Because if you are uh, selectively improving each of these, each of these steps, the synthetic, the medicinal, and the structure, you can even sophisticate the level of your research. And sophisticating the level of research ultimately means being more, much more known in the academic, in the, in the, in the audience. Because also it's quite important this aspect. A scientist for being successful should be known by the main players in a given field. And of course, if you are with the same topic playing simultaneously on different fields, you can be even much more known, each even much more successful in the in the in the portfolio in the in the panorama of, uh, of science. And just to make it clear, with the structural elucidation, you mean the NMR, X-ray, and other similar methods? I think a, a, a talented chemist should be proficient with the basics, proton, carbon, uh, mass, GCMS, HPLC, IR, and so on. But also must know two DNMR experiments which are extremely important when the level of sophistication of knowledge increases, but also is uh, extremely important for, um, is extremely important for um, understanding the reaction of optimization. For example, if you start from reagent A and you get B and C, you could uh, elucidate B and C by uh, NMR, uh, mass and so on. But then you can consider, okay, at the beginning, my target is compound B. And I would like to ideally remove C from uh, my reaction mix. But then for some reason, you could, be, you could become interested in obtaining only C instead of B. And of course, knowing the mechanism and the structural elucidation can really help you in uh, selectively achieving synthesis because uh, let's not forget that one of the big issues of synthesis is making a selective synthesis. Ideally, one compound, one starting material, one compound. And unfortunately, this is uh, extremely rare to happen without the proper modulation of the conditions. Well, Thank you very much, Mr. Pachi, for your time and this, this huge and very informative interview.